Hello. For the first lecture of this course, we're going to be talking about pollinators and general entomology. To start off, I want to briefly touch upon the process of pollination. Now, Dr. Watkins is going to talk more about this later on uh, in the course. But for now, pollination is simply the movement of pollen from the anther, which is the male part of the plant that produces the pollen, to the stigma, which is the female part of the plant that receives the pollen. In, in this diagram here. And a pollinator is simply any animal that participates in the process of pollination. So who are these pollinators? What I'm gonna do now is I wanna go through the major groups of animals that move pollen from anthers to stigmas. The first group I'm gonna talk about are bats. There are about 528 different plant species that are in fact pollinated by bats. And most of these bats and the plants that are pollinated by them are found in the neotropics, which is basically Central and South America. There, are, there is one group of bats known as the flying foxes, which are found in Australia and Asia that are also known, uh, are known to pollinate plants. And there's one species of bat that does pollinate in Africa. Now in Minnesota, we don't have any bats that are actually act as pollinators. And in fact, in much of North America, this is the case. There are some interesting species down in the Southwest, Arizona and whatnot, that actually do pollinate. But in Minnesota here, uh, we sadly don't have any bats as pollinators. But what we do have in Minnesota are bird pollination. And bird pollination is something that's found throughout the world. It's very, it's much more common in tropical systems, but we do get them um, here in Minnesota as well. What we have here, of course, is the hummingbird. There are about 300 different species of hummingbirds, and they primarily visit these long red flowers often. Um, hummingbirds are also interesting in that they're restricted to North and South America. You won't find any of these in Europe or Africa or anywhere else. And they can be really important pollinators for a lot of our uh, native plants throughout uh, the US and uh, throughout Latin America. There are a number of other species though that do pollination throughout the world that are birds one of which are the sunbirds of Africa. These birds have a very similar life history to hummingbirds that we have here, but they're really quite a bit different um, in evolutionary terms. But they are important pollinators of a number of plants in Africa. In Asia, we get honey eaters and lorikeets. This is Asia and Australia, I should say. Um, also important pollinators uh, uh, in these different uh, continents. Now there's a number of other interesting vertebrate pollinators. There's things like the honey possum, which we could talk about, and a lizard is known to be a pollinator. But in reality, the bats and the birds are the vast majority of pollinators that are vertebrates. So they really make up important pollinators as far as vertebrates are concerned. But as far as overall throughout the globe, the really the important pollinators when we think of it are this group here, which are, which are in fact the insects. And when we look at plants throughout Minnesota, the vast majority of those plants are in fact uh, pollinated by insects. And so what I wanna go over now, since we're gonna be talking about insects, a little bit about their uh, biology and then talk a little bit about their evolutionary history as well. So insects are, are, are a, a unique group of organisms and they're known by having three kind of distinct body parts, three segmentations. The first of, is the head, followed by the thorax, and then the abdomen. And just in a general sense, uh, these different segmentations use these different uh, types of, have these different types of function. So the head is primarily used as a sensory, uses to smell or to see, the, the brain is located there. The thorax is primarily used in locomotion, so the three pairs of legs and the often, this is the case, two pairs of wings are attached to the thorax, and so a lot of musculature is found in this region of an insect. And then the abdomen in, has areas for reproduction and digestion. Now to be clear, all of these different functions happen throughout all the different segments, but in a real general sense, we can say the head is for sensing, the thorax is for locomotion, and the abdomen is for reproduction and digestion. So what I want to talk about now is a bit about the diversity of life and where insects fit into that diversity. And to best represent that, what I've done here is create a uh, line that is drawn to scale that on one side has, uh, on the right there, has today in time, and then on the left side has the formation of Earth, which is four and a half billion years ago. So this is drawn here to scale. 
And about 300, uh, 3.5 billion years ago, the first evidence of life appeared. In fact, there's some new fossils out just this month from about 3.7 billion years ago, is when we're really starting to find the first evidence of life in the fossil record. And life kind of went on with this more simpler life forms for quite some time. But then about 500 million years ago, we get this thing called the Cambrian explosion. And what this is, it's not really, I put the word explosion in quotes here because this is a process that happened over millions of years. But we get this fairly rapid diversification of life forms on Earth. And we get a lot of really interesting, unique things. One of those is the trilobites, which was very abundant on Earth shortly after this time. And these are really the precursors to what we have in the insects. Now, I, what I want to do is focus a little bit more on insect evolution. So to do that, I really have to zoom in on this scale bar to this time period here. And if I didn't do that, everything would get crunched into one and you wouldn't really be able to tell uh, when these different events were happening relative to one another. So again, we have our line here, but we've zoomed in. So on the far left is our Cambrian explosion with the trilobites and the far right here is uh, today in time period. So about 450 million years ago, about 50 million years after the Cambrian explosion, insects and terrestrial plants first appear on the scene. These are some pretty simplified insects and some very simplified plants such as mosses and whatnot. No seeds, no flowers, nothing exciting like that. About 400 million years ago, the first organisms to take flight, powered flight, are the insects, and they did that about 400 million years ago. And then by about 250 million years ago, most of the groups of insects are present. So you, you would see things like some of the wasps and other sorts of organisms that you see around today, um, but not the bees as of yet. Just to give you another little, I like always putting these pieces of scale on here. If we look at this, this, is, this here points to 3 million years ago, which is when humans and chimps shared a, a common ancestor. So just to give you an idea of how long of a time period that we're dealing with here. Now we can group these different organisms into different uh, into this classification which is used for all of life on earth and you can use a bunch of different mnemonics for doing this um, and i just put in doctor here because uh, this is a mnemonic that i i knew and, and doctor was uh, for the new domains that are that are being used so dr king philip can only find gold sundays for domain kingdom phylum class order family and genus and just to give you an idea of an organism that we're going to be talking about a lot in this class, so we have the honeybee. It's in the domain eukaryota. It's in the animal kingdom. It's in the phylum anthropoda. This includes insects, but also crabs and trilobites and all sorts of things. It's in the class insecta. The order is hymenoptera. We're going to talk a bunch more about insect orders. They're usually described by their the way their wings are shaped or different properties of the wings. So P-T-E-R-A stands for wing and Hymenoptera means membrane winged. It's in the family Apidae, which is one of the seven families of bees. It's in the genus Apis and it has the species of Mellifera. And we're gonna focus a bit on this class insect. And there are two main reasons for this. One of which is that they're important pollinators and we're gonna to get to that in a second. But it's also, they really make up the vast majority of life on Earth. This is a pie chart here representing different groups of, of organisms. And what you see here is that there are relatively very few uh, number of species that are vertebrates, a little more that are plants, about a quarter that are invertebrates, and about half of the species on Earth are insects. There's about 750,000 or so named insect species. So that makes up about half of the life on Earth. So they're incredibly diverse group of organisms. So moving on from the class Insecta, we'll talk a little bit about orders. And we group insects by orders quite a bit. So in this case, this is a group we're going to be talking about a lot. We, I've just circled here the Hymenoptera, which includes ants, uh, bees, and wasps. And this here is a, is a grouping of all the different uh, insect orders. And I just want to go through and kind of group these insect orders. You don't obviously have to memorize all these different orders. That's a lot to memorize there. Um, I just want you to get an idea of the kind of basic groups that we have. The first group are the Apteriagoda, and these are uh, either arthropods, some of them are really not actually considered insects anymore, but they're groups of uh, insects or insect-like organisms that um, are wingless as adults. So as I said before, the P-T-E-R stands for wing and A stands without. So these are basically insect-like things or insects that don't have and never had in their evolutionary history uh, wings as adults. 
But all the rest of the insect orders we see here, the Teriagoda, do have, in fact, winged adults. Now, some of these uh, do not have it because they lost it through evolutionary time, but, but basically all of the adults in, in these orders have, or in evolutionary time, had wings. And these winged insects can further be delineated into two different groups, one of which is the Exoptera goda, and these are insects whose wings have developed externally. Another characteristic of the Exoptera goda is that they are also known to be hemimetabolic. And so what this is, is basically, as you see here, the grasshopper is a really good example of this. They have an egg stage, and then they hatch out to these things called nymphs, and they look the nymphs look quite a bit um, like adults do. A small young grasshopper looks very similar to uh, an adult grasshopper if you uh, are looking very quickly. So we have the hemimetabolic organisms that typically have uh, wings that develop externally. Now the other group of, of insects are the endopteriagoda, and these are insects whose wings develop internally. Now the other important characteristic is these is that they are also holometabolic. And what this means is that they go through a complete metamorphosis. So the classic example that everybody knows about here, of course, is the butterfly. It starts out as an egg, and then it has a caterpillar or worm-like looking stage. It goes through a metamorphosis, and the larvae there look quite a bit different than adults. And all these different groups that you see here are, in fact, uh, in this holometabolic, or have this complete metamorphosis. Now this group of holometabolic insects are really important and the reason to know about and the reason for this is that they're incredibly diverse. In fact, most of the insects that we have are within these, this group, this uh, holometabolic group of insects. And in fact, there are four orders, four particular orders that are, have an incredible amount of uh, biological diversity. So, um, there are, while there are 30 orders of insects, four of those that I circled earlier, those are what we call hyperdiverse. And these include the coleoptera, which are the beetles, and there's about 350,000 different named species of beetles. And that include, that it makes up over 20% of life on Earth. So if you're to line up all species on Earth and uh, count them one by one, every fifth species would in fact be a beetle. So they're incredibly, this is an incredibly diverse uh, group of organisms. Uh, in addition, we have the Lepidoptera, so these are the, um, the scale-winged insects. These are, include the butterflies and the moths, and we'll talk a bit about them as pollinators. And there's about 180,000 known species of butterflies and moths, and this, this number is just, uh, these numbers here are just a really an underestimate because we still haven't discovered all the different species that are out there. And then we have our flies. They're known as the diptera, and the reason is the die means they have two wings, unlike all the other orders we're talking about here that have uh, four wings, and they make up about 150,000 known species. And again, these are holometabolic. You can think of flies as having their maggots uh, and whatnot. And this group is, a, is a, probably a really understudied group for pollination. We actually think they're, uh, they're probably very, very important in pollinating a number of different plants and I think that the study of these organisms as pollinators is really uh, just beginning. And then finally, we have the group that we're going to spend the most ta time talking about in this class and the group that, that I really work on, which are the Hymenoptera, the membrane wind insects. And these include bees, ants, and wasps. There's about 115,000 known species of this group. Um, and this is a group that's really tough to study. There's a ton of uh, wasp species in particular that are, are not well known and well understood. So this is a really a vast underestimate for this group. And we're going to be focusing here on the bees, which is the group I study, of course, but also really thought to be the really the most important pollinators that we have uh, out in the natural world. And bees are known as this group called the anthophila, and this is a a unique clade of, of organisms within the, within the Hymenoptera that are, are all bees. Um, there are at least 20,000 known different species of bees, and this is truly an underestimate. Once uh, trained taxonomists, the more they look at these, this group of organisms, the more species that they uh, end up finding. And um, there are seven different families of these bees and about 20,000 species. And they're really highly abundant in most ecosystems. So um, with the exceptions of the far north or Antarctica 
or very high up on the mountain, high up in the uh, alpine systems. Bees are just kind of everywhere. They're really abundant. They're found, uh, found in quite a few different places. And another thing that's really unique about bees is that they rely on pollen and nectar for both their adult as well as their larval stages. This is very different than, say, uh, caterpillars and moths whose larvae will consume plant tissues, for example, leaves and stems, but the adults might consume nectar. Uh, but for bees, it's all, plant, it's all uh, nectar and pollen for both the adult and the larva. So it's all, plant, all flowers all the time for all life stages. And that has made them really good pollinators. This is a picture here of a, a helicted bee, a different species of bee. And you can see here, they're just basically flying around dust mops. They just collect pollen. Their hairs are very good at collecting pollen. They're just incredibly uh, good at doing this. So, um, and the reason for this, and this is actually a unique trait that's uh, found in bees and not found in uh, closely related wasps and other organisms, is that their hairs have this really branched type pattern, which is what you see here. This is a scanning electron microscope close up here of a, of a honeybee hair, and you can see these branches. And on those hairs are, uh, it, they're very good for, uh, pollen sticks to them very easily. And you can see this pollen grain here being stuck to this honeybee hair. So they're really, really good at uh, grabbing pollen all throughout their entire body. So that gives you a basic overview of who are the pollinators, what is pollination, uh, the insects that are involved, and kind of a nice focus on the bees. So that's a, a good start for our course, and we'll see you on Monday.